Welcome to the Marketing Innovators Podcast. Today, we have a very exciting guest, David Hawthorne, who is a passionate marketing executive with over 15 years of experience building and leading high-performance teams. As VP of Marketing and Communication, David leads the Marketing, Communications, and Events teams at United Way Winnipeg. Previously, he led the marketing teams at the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Magellan Luxury Hotels, uh, and McNally Robinson Booksellers. He brings a consistent track record of driving innovation, uh, overachieving on financial targets, and cultivating a high-performance culture. He is passionate and about leading people, establishing accountable and committed team environments with a bias towards action, and fostering innovation. David has an aptitude for all aspects of marketing, with a particular focus on digital strategy and implementation. David, welcome to the show. Hello. It's really good to have you here. I mean, I've been actually going through your journey a little bit and also reading more about you online. And I know we had a chat a few days ago about uh, just your backstory. So maybe we can start with that and you can tell us a little bit about how you actually ended up here at United Way. So my, um, my career in marketing started sort of at an early age. Um, when I was a kid, I rode BMX bikes. And... Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to have some sponsors and I got to travel. And when I started traveling, um, my parents said to me, you know, David, it's unlikely you're ever going to be back in these places. Take your camera, take a lot of pictures. So I went all over America. I went to Europe. Um, I was spent a year and a half in Asia, in, in China. I went to communist China. I went all over the place. Um, and I took a ton of pictures and I would shoot, normal travel pictures, but I'd also shoot the BMX events I was at. And as I was shooting all of these photos, I would show them to um, the people from the big BMX magazines. I would be like, hey, I have these pictures. And, and they always were very, very encouraging and they were very kind. And they basically said, hey, some of these pictures are actually good enough to be in the magazine if we had a story around them. So you should write a story and we'll put this in. And you know, that really worked worked well for me. Um, there's Chase BMX magazine was a Canadian magazine that first started publishing some of my work. Um, and after Chase went away, I actually got a job with a British bike magazine being their um, North American correspondent, essentially, I had a, a column every month on like Canadian news. And I went to a lot of American BMX contests. And I shot a ton of pictures of the events and a lot of the Canadian riders. And at the end of one of the years, I looked at all the pictures that I had that the British magazine didn't really need. And they were all Canadian riders that were coming up. And I talked to some of my sponsors and some of the Canadian distributors. And I actually had enough to put a magazine together. So I started um, my own magazine. It was quarterly. It was called Red BMX Magazine. And it, was, it ran for six years as a print and then a couple more as a, as a website. And, you know, in that time, you know, I really learned marketing. It was, it was always fun to go out and shoot content and, and ride my bike. But at the end of the day, when I wanted the magazine to actually work, it was about marketing. It was about building a community around the brand. It was about selling ads. It was about understanding what the advertisers needed for their investment in the magazine. And those are the lessons that I learned um, with my own money. So I learned them well. And when I made mistakes, I knew exactly how significant the mistake was. Um, it was really interesting. I went um, to university um, for the same stuff. But all in all, I think I learned more at the magazine than I, than I learned in actual school. Um, so when the magazine was, was done, and I was actually more aging out of BMX, um, I took a job with one of the, the people that helped me most with the magazine, which was a, a bookstore in Winnipeg, which was McNally Robinson. They helped me get national distribution with my magazine. Um, they were very, very helpful. So I had some good friends there and I went to work with them and I was their director of marketing for eight years. And McNally Robinson um, is a national, was a national independent bookseller. Um, the years I was there, I think we won Best Bookstore in Canada six of those years. We had locations in Calgary, Saskatoon, um, two in Winnipeg, and one in Toronto. It was, it was a big deal, and it was a super good time. 
um, one of the most interesting projects we worked on was getting our site uh, ready for retail sales and to compete with Amazon as it was coming in. We are large format bookstores, independent large format bookstores. We became um, large format as chapters in Indigo were starting to come into Canada. And we went big format as a way to protect ourselves. Um, the next big threat to bookstores was online retail. And it was starting, it was the early days of it. It was the mm -hmm. early 2000s. So then people were just starting to talk about SEO. They were just talking about social marketing. And um, McNally Robinson really needed to build community online quickly to be able to fend off Amazon. So we did early day SEO. Um, we did early day social. And in that ex time, um, we did quite well for who we were. And uh, when Google came to Canada looking for a Google Books Canada reseller, um, they picked McNally Robinson based on our digital footprint and on how well we had done um, building that digital experience. So that was great. Um, I was really proud of that. I learned a ton of digital in that time. And when I left the bookstore, um, I actually went into a completely digital environment at Magellan Luxury Hotels, which is an online luxury hotel booking agency. Um, it's another Winnipeg success story. It's a, it's a great business. Essentially, um, the founder figured out a way of getting really um, the best rate possible at a bunch of really expensive hotels in 10 destination cities in um, America. And um, essentially, he told the hotels that he would not put the, the price online, that he would advertise and then push to a phone call. And then when you get the phone call, you get the price it's only available for the the length of that call essentially and and it's it's a really good service but that was a very interesting time to learn a ton about digital um after that i went to the the blue bombers the current um gray cup champion blue bombers it's it's great that they have done so well um and there it wasn't it was digital and it was working with the ticketmaster platform in addition to everything else uh, but it was also a lot of traditional and it was a lot about um, customer experience and it's a lot about um, building community around a brand and i think the bombers was a, a great a great learning environment um, but it was also exhausting and i got tired at a point and i needed needed to change so i had some friends um, we had a company called FXR, which is um, Factory Extreme Racing, and they make high-end um, winter wear with an eye towards snowmobile racing, and they also do a lot of motocross work. And while I was there, um, I revamped their marketing and um, helped with the website and redid their digital, and I made a lot of videos about snowmobiling and um, riding dirt bikes. And it was awesome. wonderful, but it couldn't last forever um, <laughs> because United Way Winnipeg came knocking. And when the opportunity came to make an impact in my community, I was really happy to be able to to take that on and, and just step up to the challenge of, of how you build community around United Way Winnipeg. Hmm. That's really uh, an interesting journey uh, there, David. And, you know, it's it's often, you know, we have a lot of marketing professionals that listen to this podcast that kind of are starting their journey in the marketing world and some are transitioning into marketing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's always uh, this, uh, this ex you know, they're expecting to be at a certain position at a certain time frame. But looking at how you've actually seen marketing grow over the past uh, decade or so, it's been a, a significant transition, even as to how we do things. Um, and especially when working with nonprofits uh, and working in a, at a meaningful organization such as United Way, can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, you know, what is actually working for the brand at this stage? Well, you know, it's the traditional things are always working. So like when I approach a brand and I start fresh, what I do is like there's the basics that you always have to figure out. An email program, search, um, display, social, right? 
it's it's the basics and i mean a lot of this now is content driven so you need to figure out how and where to start with really good content you need to be able to tell your stories effectively quickly with impact um that is the that is basically what i see as the current push and i think that that will always be true um you know i don't really i don't really play to platforms i am um what what is the word house cat okay always work for the business i'm always inside and none of the places i've ever worked have huge budgets so i've never been able to really spend a lot of money or have an agency to do the work for me so i've always kind of done it myself and i've always had to um, answer to my community or to the owner of the business so every dollar that i've spent has i have to know it's effective so i can never play to the platforms or the whims of the platforms as they change so i stay really true to a few values and the first one is like tell your story tell talk about your experience with the brand that you have and think about your brand as an experience think about the person who's ex has that experience with your brand and all of the touch points in it think of the whole thing um, as an ecosystem and then look at where you can actually move the needle but it's all about telling your story effectively through any marketing material hmm. so um, obviously working with uh, certain businesses in the startup phase before you are uh, used to those tight budgets when coming to United Way because I know nonprofits and working with such organizations you don't really have a big budget when it comes to creating that level of impact um, so by investing in some of the content strategies that you've actually laid out, have you found that certain things work better than others? Um, yes. So there's a lot, like the, the one core thing that I think works is understanding who your donors are and understanding what values are important to them and talking to them about those values. I think it's really important. I think a lot of nonprofits tell their story as they want to hear it, but they don't think about the donor's perspective in it. And I think you really have to step outside of your brand and really empathize with the people that you're talking to. Talk to them about what's important, how they talk. Hmm. So it's all, it's about putting the customer first all the time. And I think in digital hmm. right now, that's even more important. I think with all of the changes in digital, it's like the end of cookies, I mean, Facebook is like basically getting crushed by Apple. A lot of like the targeting and the super accurate um, targeting that we were able to do last year is gone. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of playing to the platforms and being hyper targeted on individual people, now it's about standing up and building out what you actually have to communicate and telling your story better and more effectively. I think that will always help you no matter what, no matter what happens with any of the platforms in any given day. And I mean, like the flock has come through like Google's um, new way of figuring out who to target for ads has come through quite well. And it's actually showing that it works better than cookies, at least all the research that I have seen and our very short experiments. I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks now, but as I say this, it's like, it looks like it actually works quite a bit better um, but it's finding people in the fringes. It's not, it's, it's targeting on cohorts, right? So you're in a cohort with a bunch of other people that like the same things. And some of those people will not have heard about your brand. They will not show up in keyword analysis, right? They will only show up through sentiment analysis, which I think is actually like from what I've been reading about the updates to, um, how Google's ranking that the sentiment analysis is going to be coming through more important. Mm, absolutely. Sentimental uh, analysis, as well as um, when it comes to user experience, they're really keen about, you know, pushing uh, those brands that are delivering uh, a good user experience uh, that are, yes. uh, so that's a, that's a really key part. And often, you know, when it comes to a lot of businesses that are trying to get better positioning in Google, they forget that it's no longer about just keywords and content. It's, it's a combination of, it hundreds is. of factors that can actually impact your rankings and yeah. uh, the bigger your I, I think UX is yeah. yeah UX is the thing I think 
like the, the technical building of your website and how aesthetically it works and how it helps guide people to the right information is so critical right now. It cannot be um, overestimated. I think it's, it's a huge impact. And when people design websites, I think you really need to take your time now and think more about UX than you have traditionally. I mean, UX has been a hot topic for two years, but now that cookies are over, I think it's going to be a, a more substantial conversation. Yeah, and then, you know, it, it just goes to show that digital platforms are so turbulent. There's always things that are changing, regulations that are evolving, and restrictions that are being made on in, information that can be shared between different platforms. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting how marketers then need to adapt based on this new direction and these new limitations that come across. But I would actually caution on even using the word limitation because I think it actually expands your, uh, you know, your, your, your view of, of what can be done. And by focusing on the user and what their, what their needs are, you can still target the right kind of audience in a very effective way and not be as narrow-minded yes. as, uh, you know, some of the analytics sometimes unfortunately drive our marketing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that, I think digitally we've gotten a little bit too targeted, but I think now Apple is no longer going to be telling email platforms who opened their emails or clicked on what. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting because I think the email marketing is going to have to change towards good content for more people. Um, I think the flock stuff and the end of cookies is going to change that. And I think Apple's setting on just what how accurate Facebook ad targeting can be is also going to really change that game. You know what? Right now, I will say, when I think of any digital platform, I think they are all changing. I think it's a very turbulent time for all of the platforms. So I think right now it's a it's a time when we really need to be guided by our principles, guided by our strategies. We need to sit back and figure out what our actual strategy is and stick to it because the platforms are going to be changing for the next little bit, um, but our strategies won't. And, you know, I think a lot of mar digital marketing people um, sit at their desks and they get pressure from their managers to have impact in the next month, the next week, the next day. But that's not how this really works anymore. I think there are, when you're on the right path, I think there are short-term easy gains to make. But I think you should think of the year. I think people always overestimate what they can do in a given year. But I think they also underestimate what they can do in three. So I think in there, in that timeline, you should think about your strategy in three-year blocks. I think you should work towards things. I think you should report against that strategy. Um, and then the platforms aren't as big of a deterrent when they make a change. It, it doesn't, I mean, sometimes it's gut-wrenching. When you have a great working uh, plan and it's going to it's going exactly how you want and and Google just wakes up in the morning and changes their whole way they do things and you're like left reevaluating and trying to figure out what to do I mean those are stressful days but I think if you have a larger strategy of how you want to build your brand right mm -hmm. which sort of leads me into the next thing is people often think about digital as purely activation it's purely about getting the conversion and I think there's a lot of really good opportunities to do that, to act, to activate and to convert digitally. It's clearly, it's one of the, the best conversion engines ever built. But I also think that you really need to focus on brand. And I use sort of a 60-40 rule about developing brand to conversion. So it's, it's about building, building that brand so it can convert better. Um, and, and just how you activate. And I mean, there's times of year when that 60, 40 sort of inverts, depending on what you need it to do. But as a general rule, I plan, I try and plan a couple of years out and I use a 60, 40 brand activation calculation or ratio. And I make sure that a lot of my work is, is continuing to build the brand just so people recognize it. And it's far easier to convert on a known brand. There is a ton of value. I mean, I don't need to say this to a bunch of marketing people, but there is a ton of value in having a strong brand. Hmm. I think That's nonprofits true. don't think like that. Yeah, I, I was going to say that they definitely should because, you know, they're, again, re representing a brand. And I think, you know, often, yes, they may be working for a great cause, but that's just not enough. 
to drive yeah. people to to them and you know you have to be very clear in your messaging you have to be really you know um clear about your brand experience and and how you want that to relate to your target audience so i think that a lot of uh, nonprofits miss out on that and they feel that marketing is you know is more of an expense rather than an investment when it should be the reverse um yes. to some extent at least marketing should always drive revenue it's yeah. it's key and when done well it does that's like true. when it is when it is a cost center something's wrong yeah so with with united way i mean you know you certainly have some challenges there definitely you are using uh, a number of different um, platforms to promote the content that uh, is being created. Have you uh, recognized or have you felt that there are certain platforms? I mean, you've been mentioning a lot about Google and uh, have you seen Google um, be better in some ways than Facebook to promote your message or have, what has really worked on those platforms? So from a branding perspective, I will say the reach of Google is amazing um point blank i think facebook is good as well um most nonprofits will most likely be in smaller markets so within smaller markets i think facebook does quite well um i think facebook is a better conversion point in a better way to amplify content where google is a better way to just carry brand mm. i know it's a hard distinction and there's a lot of the Venn diagram of those two things that overlap. But what I'm trying to draw a distinction is, is the kind of communication that you do through Google, through banner ads and search is different than as it is in Facebook. And the better content on Facebook is driven by content that links to something, to stories, to everything. I think you need to really be aware of how people use Facebook and what their ex expectation, the user's expectation on the platform and fulfill that primarily and then you, you'll get far more success for your ads and then on google it's just much more of it's a branding opportunity but it's also um more of an activation space i think people clicking on banner ads understand more what they're getting right mm -hmm. on facebook the conversion may take longer but it's about getting them into the sales funnel Right, it's about warming the, the community up to what you're doing. So, how do you measure impact? Like, wh what do you feel works well when it comes to, let's say, you know, putting forth certain metrics? Because obviously, with the limitations of tracking, you know, the metrics have to be redefined as well. And uh, you know, we're thinking, what what is the what really defines as an impact for you? Is it the end result, which is the transaction of donation, or is it more like creating awareness for the content, um, or something else? So, I measure everything. First of all, and there is, um, so a brand awareness as a judge of brand health, right? I do a straight brand equity, like I track brand equity. So I track in their reach. Um, I do general market research, um, to find out attributes, like what people think of the brand, right? Um, I also, follow awareness levels and I, I i do all that calculation just for the brand side of it on the activation side i do go to conversion and i go to money raised mm -hmm. clicks like when i look at my analytics the other thing about it is at the end of the day revenue is the most important thing but when i'm looking at analytics what i'm looking for is troubleshooting ads like if i have no one clicking on the ads are they serving to the right people right so if they are clicking but they're getting to the landing page and bouncing. What's wrong with the landing page? If they're, mm -hmm. if they're landing on the landing page, but they're not making a donation, what's wrong with the UX? What's wrong with the conversion point there? If they're getting to that point, but they're still not giving, what's wrong with the donation form, right? So I track like all of the analytics that they show you, the vanity analytics that people love to talk about, like their click through and, and their CTR, I, to me, are things for troubleshooting and analyzing the campaign. I don't really share those with um, my manager. I, I share revenue. I share overall numbers, like how many people read something, right? As it's interesting. But at the end of the day, it's like my manager's interest in how much investment, um, 
the return on ad spend is the most important thing. And that's where I keep um, my boss. Like that's what we talk about. Now within my team, I mean, every single analytic is really important, but it speaks to a specific issue that we wanna make sure is working well. And then we look and see where people are dropping off. Is the content that we're making truly interesting? Google will tell you. You know, like one of the best things that I've been using Google for last year was actually making display ads of what I was going to use for print ads later to seeing which one people clicked on, mm -hmm. right? Because I want to see what resonates, but I, I can't afford to do actual market research. I bring a company together to look at five ads and be like, oh, we like this one. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing is I make like the big box equivalent of all of the ads that we have, mm -hmm. right? And, and just to see where we're at. And whichever ad comes through, which resonates, gets the most clicks, is the ad that I actually end up using in print. Which I mean, that is a super inexpensive way to really know that you're going the right direction. And it's an extremely important step as well, because that A-B testing really, you know, allows you to understand what is going to work when you actually do yeah. send it for print. So, yeah. Yeah, like print is so expensive for what it is, but it does have its place. You can't really A-B test it. You only get one chance, right? And in a nonprofit, it's not like I'm running like three kinds of ads. It's like I, I have the ads I'm going with. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So where do you see are some of the biggest opportunities for United Way in the near future when it comes to marketing? Um, you know, I think that we, I'm investing a lot in more people to create content right now. Yeah. I think good, relevant content um, that it's timely is super important. And United Way Winnipeg uh, supports a network of 100 agencies. Um, and those 100 agencies have a really important story to tell every single day. So there is no shortage of really impactful stories that our donors and future donors really want to hear about. They want to know that their investment in us is going into the community and making the difference that they make. And where we're at right now is trying to figure out a way to scale making that much content. And, mm -hmm. and just, having, just having the next level of being able to produce enough content to figure out what people really wanna talk about and to be able to personalize um, how we deliver the content to them based on possibly an issue, possibly a few issues. But it's like, it's, you're making an investment in your community because you want to see certain outcomes. Um, and it's our responsibility to be able to source those outcomes and those stories so that you know that you're really making a difference. So true. So with regards to your background, I mean, considering that you've had this major shift and uh, you know, you've actually seen the marketing evolve in the past decade, what would you give your younger self advice if you were to go back 10 years? You know what? Um, I was very impatient. I, I wasn't willing to wait. You know, I always wanted to change the campaign. I wanted to change, like if, if something wasn't working after two weeks, I, I wanted to like rip it apart and rebuild it from scratch. And now I think, and I think what, what I'm about to say is backed up by a lot of research. But, you know, it used to be that a camp a campaigns work best on three-year cycles. You have a year of establishing, you have a year of optimizing, and you have a year of doing super well while you start to work on the next thing. And I wish I, kn I, wish I saw that or when, I, when I was younger. I feel I was working on the next thing and the current thing all the time. And I, ne I feel like I didn't give things room to grow into everything that they could be. So now I'm stepping back and I'm seeing that, that things really need, like if you have a great idea for a campaign and it doesn't seem to resonate in the first month, that's okay. Just optimize it, build it out, build the idea out, work on, on fully flushing it out before, before pulling it. That's, that's what I would, tell myself and mm. you know what I would say 
I think it would be a weird conversation, but I would tell myself that marketing is a job that you will never work the same day twice. This, this is a career that is dedicated to learning and the people that seem to do it best are the people who love engaging in change and they, they don't need both feet firmly on the ground. They need one kind of touching the ground or they're probably not going to be employed long, but they need to stay, you need to stay grounded, but just a little bit. Think big, be willing to learn a lot and like dedicate that, dedicate myself like time every day to figuring out what's going on next and, and to be looking long term at things. That's what I would tell myself. I, that sounds so cheesy, but like this job is about learning. It's about changing and it's about, it's the people that do it well are the people who are creative and have an appetite for change and, and are excited. Like Google changing cookies is so huge. Um, and I know a lot of people really concerned, but also it's like a huge opportunity. If you just started in digital marketing last year, pretty much everything you know is now wrong and you got to start again completely, right? Which I mean, is kind of funny, but it's also great. It means there's a, there's a, there's a new opportunity to figure out new strategies for doing this work. And that is great. Like that's, it's a wonderful opportunity that, you know, other industries just don't get like this. Like we don't get everything completely different all at once in a three month period ever. <laughs> we are so all, true. we are all at the same point right now. Nobody knows what they're doing. We're all on square one, <laughs> figuring out what the future will be. And that's great. It's great for me. Yeah. I love it. Mm. Definitely throws in a wrench with the marketing strategies and especially those companies and organizations that tend to have this long-term strategy. But, you know, we're dealing with a very turbulent, uh, you know, uh, state when it comes to marketing, especially online uh, with digital marketing. And I think that's what's shown in the past few months is that, you know, things have changed drastically. And many marketers are, are you know, they're fearful about, you know, how they're going to manage this change. But then there's others that have that open mind, that have that willingness to learn, that see this as an opportunity. And I think that's the way to yeah. look at it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely because the other way is not going to work at all. <laughs> it's like, it's good. It's good if you have a strategy that doesn't go into the weeds on everything. If you know yeah. who you are and where you want to go, right? Just that's all you need. It's like you, you have a real understanding of who you are and you have a real understanding of two years from now, here's where you want to be, right? Now, all the ups and downs in the platforms, they're not as close to the heart. Mm -hmm. If you are just like, I'm going to try and maximize my AdWords today, it's, it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be really That's hard. True. That's true. So based on your experience and the challenges that you've overcome, the past few months being one of them, <laughs> if there was one big takeaway that you could give to our listeners, what would that be? You know what? It would be um, don't, don't worry about what you need to accomplish in the next three months. Think more about the year. Yeah. Right. The next three months are going to be hard for us. We're all figuring out what's going on. We'll get there. Um, but don't set your goals on 90 days. Set your goals on on 12 months mm -hmm. at a minimum. If you can go longer than that, if, if, if your manager will let you, you should. But just understand what your goals are, big picture, and then work down from there. So true. So... David, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, where can people find you online and where can they learn more about you? So probably like, I am not like an agency, so I don't have a product or anything. Um, you can you can hit me up on LinkedIn if you'd like. Um, I love talking marketing, um, but I don't know. I have United, United Way Winnipeg if you want to check our website out, but you can find me on, on LinkedIn if you like. Sounds good. We'll great. definitely include, yeah, we'll definitely include the, uh, the links to... Uh, United Way, as well as uh, your profile there in the article. And uh, I, I certainly wish you the best in your career and you know, look forward to staying in touch and seeing how things move forward here in the next few months. Yes, thank you so much. You know, it's been great to talk marketing. Excellent, take care, Dave. <laughs>